I have a very clear and specific memory of my first apartment that I lived in in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I had moved after I graduated from college. And not just that it was a glorified studio. They called it a junior one bedroom, which I learned the hard way is a studio where there's just a door between the other parts and the place where there's room for a bed. And it was, you know, it was a historic building. There was no air conditioning. The windows worked-ish. And uh, the, when I had first moved in, there was no furniture. I think I had a sleeping bag. And I remember laying on the floor of that apartment. I think I had gotten a fan by that point, which was good, because it was August in Maryland. Those of you who have, you're like, yes, you know the swamp. You are like, yes. How, how very swampy my life was. And I was laying on the floor of that apartment because I had just realized that I was not straight. Mm -hmm. And I felt both astonished and I felt honestly sort of Foolish, right? I had grown up Unitarian Universalist. I had taken OWL. How had it taken me this long to figure this out? But there I was, laying on the floor, wondering what I was going to do about that. Everything was going to change. Nothing was the same. And so I laid there in what I now think of as a goo phase. <laughs> Most people who have come out of the closet as something other than straight, uh, we have all had our goo phases, haven't we? It's, very, it's some gooier than others. Um, <laughs> And we love to watch or hear about or listen to somebody else's goo phase, don't we? We love to hear somebody talk about all the change that they went through. We love to hear stories and watch movies and read books and read celebrity profiles about people going through their goo phase. It's what makes compelling stories that somebody turns in from a caterpillar and does not sort of metamorphose gracefully, magically into a butterfly, but first, like, secretes an enzyme that dissolves their own muscles. And the stories that we love to see, right, think about, right, Luke Skywalker in the swamp on Dagobah, goo face. Elsa in her ice palace, goo face. Michael Jordan going to play baseball, Classic goo face. <laughs> Classic goo face. And even here at the fellowship, we like to hear other people stand up here and tell us about their goo phases, right? We love to ask the worship leader to we're like, tell us about a time it was hard for you so we can all just listen. <laughs> and think secretly about our own goo phases, but not have to tell anybody. And that's because we enjoy being part of a goo phase, much less. The process of having everything you thought you knew about yourself or about your world or about your partner or about your family or about your community, having everything you thought you knew dissolve is not what we think of as a um, pleasant time. I enjoyed the euphemism, unwelcome experiences. And it is particularly hard when we are not alone in a goo phase. Goo phases are hard enough when you just have to deal with your own stuff. When it's your goo phase, then you can just lay on the floor of the apartment for a while get your act together eventually. But the truth is that it is not just individual human beings who go through goo phases. It's communities of human beings, too. 
Come join the fellowship where you can swim in the goo with hundreds of other people. I'm still workshopping the bumper sticker, I'll admit. <laughs> welcome, suggestions welcome. Um, because the truth is that the fellowship is in a goo phase. And that if you are new today, which I know some of you are, welcome to our goo phase. <laughs> We're swimming in the goo. Um, because we are a community. We are right a system of human beings, and because human beings go through goo phases, systems go through goo phases too. And like your goo phases in your own life, it's not always fun. In part because those of you who have been around for a few years, approaching a decade or more for many of you, it feels like the fellowship has kind of been in a goo phase for a while now. It's like we've had a series of successive goo phases <laughs> that began with the long-tenured senior minister, Reverend Roger Birchhausen, retiring from this position. And then uh, there was an interim period, an interim minister, which is right one of those sort of like intentional goo phases that is not always fun. And then Reverend Christina was called. And then we had a pandemic, a global goo phase, if you will. We're still figuring out if we're in it or not. And then the associate minister of many years, Reverend Leah, left her position to move closer to family and for her partner's work. And then Ali, Minister Ali was here and then not. And then Reverend Christina was on medical leave. Goo face, goo face, goo face, goo face. It can feel like all around you, muscles are dissolving, essential structures are technically in place, but it's more soup than substance. And some of you, maybe you say, I don't feel the soup. And that's great. But soup there is, nonetheless. And so this year has been another intentional goo phase, because you'll notice in that list of goo phases that I just gave, as is the truth in your own lives as well, sometimes you don't get to choose the goo phase. It just comes for you. But sometimes you choose it. Sometimes you choose to take a break from something and take stock of things, pause for a moment, and consider who and where you are. And that is what Reverend Christina has done and what the fellowship has done over the last four months of Reverend Christina's sabbatical. And I have heard from some of you that this intentional goo phase has been so smooth. You're like, everything seems great. Great, everything seems like it's going really well. And so if you think it hasn't been gooey, I'm going to present a piece of evidence about the state of the area on the other side of that wall, which under the thoughtful stewardship of Reverend Christina is a well-oiled machine of orderly supplies, but is one of many things that over the last four months has dissolved into a formless, snot-like substance. <laughs> it's not great. If you think like, that looks, see, uh, I took those pictures and then put them in the slideshow and then I was like, I think that looks pretty okay. And then I remembered that my standards for organization are a little lower than average. <laughs> but yes, you can see a combination, right? You're like, there's the manger from Christmas Eve and those hearts from January and some pageant, some solstice costumes. Those, bi oh, what are those bins? There's like, a mil the fabric art is just kind of hanging out. If you look in the upper corner, you can see that November's decorations are unfiled, tucked back in a corner. Thank you, we can, we can stop looking at that now. <laughs> the truth is, it's gotten a little gooey, and in ways that many of you wouldn't see. But the truth is that your staff 
and myself and a core of lay leaders, especially those who are engaged in the ministries that are normally under the stewardship of Reverend Christina, have all felt a little ah, over the last four months. Goo phase. And though it has felt pretty gooey around here for a while, if we take a moment for a lesson from nature, I want to talk about the imaginal discs. And I want to talk about how it is that those butterflies get out of their goo phases, because maybe there's a lesson for us about how we can get out of our goo phase, not permanently <laughs> congealed into a snot-like substance inside a chrysalis. I think it is so incredible that there are those imaginal discs, which are sometimes called, they, I've heard them called imaginal cells or imago cells. There's an amazing, if you want to nerd out about goo, I highly recommend there's an episode of the podcast Radio Lab called Goo and You that goes into the whole, like, the metaphysical dimensions of goo. It's amazing. Um, but maybe I just have a thing for goo phases. I don't know. But those imaginal discs... That name, imaginal, that word imaginal, it is the same root as the word imagination. Because that is what they contain, essentially. They contain an, a picture, an image, a blueprint for something that does not yet exist. They point to possibility. They point to the capacity to envision a future that is not yet real. That that caterpillar has never lived, has never done. That caterpillar has never been a butterfly before. And that, right, that one tiny clump of 50 cells becomes thousands of cells, becomes half of a butterfly's wing. Those imaginal disks are powerful because they are not limited to what they were when they entered the chrysalis. They are not limited by the feeling that they wish they were still a caterpillar. Because that's the trick about human goo phases as opposed to goo phases in Mother Nature, is that we have the ability to wish it weren't happening. We have the ability to whine about it in a way that I do not, to my knowledge, a caterpillar has never whined <laughs> about dissolving into goo and becoming a butterfly. But we, blessed human beings have evolved the ability to be mad about change, <laughs> for it to be hard for us to drag our heels, to kick and scream, It's one of those things about human beings that is both an amazing expression of our free will and also sometimes, I'm like, that's a little buggy, human beings, aren't we? But the truth is that each of us here today, whether this is your first Sunday or your 10th or your 100th or your 500th, Each of us is an imaginal cell, an imaginal disk. Each of you, each person on Zoom, each child and volunteer in the RE wing, each of us is a clump of 50 cells, or I mean, not really. Don't yell at me later, biologists. Um, I know that each of you contains more than 50 cells. But we are that small piece that here in the goo has the capacity to become something more. 
not by remaining the same clump of cells we were when we walked in or rolled in, but by becoming something new, something different, by expanding, by multiplying, by being part of something more. But it's not just that each of us can become something more. It's not just that each of us is one of those imaginal cells and somehow we will all mystically come together and make a butterfly. It's that that goo has memory. That in the goo is not just the blueprint for a butterfly. But in the goo is also all of the memories of all the things the caterpillar has ever seen and done and been. Because that's one of the fascinating and wonderful and sometimes tricky and always interesting parts about joining a community is that you bring your own story, you bring your own blueprint, you bring your own image of what might be, but you also join the soup Again, we're working on the bumper stickers. Join the soup. Um, of all that has been, of all that has happened, of all the histories and stories that have been here, they're all in the goo with us. The memories of founding this community in the 1950s. the memories of the decision to buy a building, which was not this building, this is not the original building that the fellowship purchased in its history. The memory of the decision to call their first full-time minister, which was of course preceded by the decision to explore it in the first place. All the memories of the decision to buy the land that we're gathered on today to build that part of the building, to build this part of the building. All of these decisions, all of these people, all of the lives of everyone engaged, it's all here in the goo with us. People you have never met. People who died before I was born. They're here. They inform the blueprint that we make, and we carry all of that story with us. Back lying on the floor of my apartment in Baltimore, I needed help imagining a way forward. Imagining my way out of the sort of primal scream, everything is changing, who am I, goo, into a future where I was both fully myself and fully happy, both the person I was becoming and the person I had always been. And because I was truly and fully for my entire life a church nerd, it was my first full kind of weekend in Baltimore, and I, it was time, right, it was like Saturday night, which meant it was time to go to church the next morning, but it was a new church that I had never been to. I kept, and I just had the most banana town irrational thought, which was, of course, I, I can't go. They're gonna know. It's like, they're gonna know that I'm a mess. They're gonna know that I don't have it all figured out. They're gonna know that I have no idea what I'm doing. But I went, and it was a deep reminder for me that my goo, my story, my uncertainty was held in something much larger than my own angst on the floor of my apartment, that there was a longer story that I got to be a part of 
that could hold all of my gooeyness and would in turn ask me to hold some of its gooeyness. Because that church has been around since 1817 in Baltimore, and they, they goo phases left and right. <laughs> and so you are here, being invited to let us hold some of your gooeyness, and in turn, that you might hold some of our collective gooeyness too. And when Reverend Christina comes back to work tomorrow, and we don't tell her about what's behind that wall, (laughs) she will return also with her own imaginal cells that she has been nurturing and discovering during her sabbatical with her own sense of what is possible and her own gooeyness her own dreams for what might come out of the goo here. So this is your moment to pause for an invitation to bring your goo here and help us with a little bit of ours. May it be so. Amen.